Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson, and I'm here with the 13th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. There's a yoga workshop in the house today, so I'm out here in the trailer, <laughs> in the <a> tent. <laughs> but it doesn't matter where we are, as long as we're in the right state of mind. That's what this is all about. So let's continue from where we left off yesterday. To recap briefly, Nibbana is the most important concept of the Buddha's teaching because it's the goal. It's the reason for the whole thing in the first place. So it doesn't mean anything if we say we're a Buddhist or we're following Buddha's path or Eightfold Path or whatever, unless we can actually attain Nibbana. And to do that, we have to know what it is. What about if we attained Nibbana and we didn't even know it? <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some obstacles. And the chief obstacle, the way I see it, is the commentaries on the original Theravada suttas. The commentators made up their own definitions for the words, ignoring the normal dictionary definitions. And because of that, they created an immense amount of confusion. And of course, then there's commentaries on the commentaries and popular versions of the commentaries and so on, to the point where nobody is reading the original Buddha suttas. And that's a real shame because these suttas, the Theravada suttas, are as bright as the sun. They're as clear as the day. Everything is there. And if you simply take them as at their face value and in their direct meaning, then you can immediately get a very clear idea of Nibbana. Now, unfortunately, the nature of religious institutions and organizations is to obfuscate the obvious truth. Why is that? Well, when you have a big church or a big temple and lots of monks to support, then you want to have a congregation who is going to give to you for a long time. And if people could come and get Nibbana very quickly, maybe they would just go away. <laughs> they wouldn't need you anymore. In other words, it's a strategic advantage for a religious organization to obfuscate the goal, to make it harder to reach Nibbana. Now, I don't think anybody, uh, well, I know some people who actually do it deliberately, but I don't think anyone in the beginning did it deliberately. They're just trying to make ends meet. But it's a fact that if you can easily get the goal, then you have no more need for the teacher, isn't it? The Buddha didn't care because the Buddha was a real monk. He was renounced and whatever came to him, he accepted it. And if nothing came, that was fine too. But uh, monks nowadays are very attached to their big temples, very attached to their nice gifts and elaborate ceremonies, very attached to their rituals and their rules and so on. So even though the Buddha says that the first symptom of someone who realizes Nibbana is that they aren't attached to these things anymore, uh, still, we have to accept that's human nature. That's the way people are. So what to do? Well, the best thing is to, to know enough about the commentaries so that you can more or less subtract their influence from the original teaching and get down to a clear understanding. And fortunately, my mentor, Bhikkhu Nyanananda, has done that. And he bequeathed to me an enormous trove of research data, which I'm going through little by little to make these talks. So the main point that we've been discussing in this second part of our series is that Nibbana is not annihilationism. It's not nihilism. In other words, we don't say that Nibbana is the end of everything. Unfortunately, some people mistranslate Nibbana as extinction, when really the proper word would be extinguishment. 
it's kind of an awkward term, but it much more carries the real flavor of the meaning of Nibbana. Because the word Nibbana is not exclusive to talking about the end or the objective of the Buddhist teaching. There are at least 32 more terms that do that. But Nibbana became the most popular uh, epithet or uh, verbal symbol or pointer to that state because of the fire simile. And we've been going over the fire simile in quite some detail in the last few episodes. So let's move on. So the problem with Nibbana is that it's not a thing. It's not a state of being. And it's not a, even a process. In fact, you can't say that it exists or doesn't exist, or that it's real or unreal, or that it's a state of being or non-being. Why is that? Because Nibbana is simply beyond all of these distinctions. So whenever anybody would present the Buddha with a question containing a dilemma or a tetralemma, uh, where either this or that is true, or maybe both are true, or maybe none of them are true, he would reject the question. And he would say, I don't believe anymore, I don't accept anymore positions, which means an extreme take on something, yes or no, true or false, right or wrong. But I follow the middle path in between, which is the path of becoming. The process of becoming is called paticca samupada, and very few Buddhists actually understand it or have even heard of it. Unfortunately, especially Western Buddhists, don't seem to understand it at all. So, the commentators were uncomfortable with this, Nibbana. Uh, I don't know why they just didn't pick up another term that was more to their liking. But instead what they did was try to reinterpret the meaning of Nibbana in a different way to avoid the charge of annihilationism or nihilism. And we've been over some of these. We're going to take a look at some more now. The chief misunderstanding of the commentators is that they tried to make Nibbana into a thing or a place. And they used expressions like attain Nibbana, which would make it a thing, or go to Nibbana, which would make it a place. And of course, <laughs> one of the uh, most basic things about Nibbana is that it's not a thing, it's not an object, and it's not a place. Why is it not an object? Because in Nibbana there is no subject. But how can there be an object without a subject? Uh, in grammar, we have to have a subject, an object, and a predicate. In other words, an actor, a verb, or action, and the uh, receiver of that action. That's our linguistic rules, and without which language doesn't make any sense. But in Nibbana, there is no more of this tripleness, huh? the ontological tripleness that describes being is well known. We've gone over it in uh, so many other of our series. But in Nibbana, this tripleness is gone. And I'm not going to say that it's oneness. <laughs> That's another subject we can get into. But there is no such thing as oneness. There is such a thing as zeroness, though. And Nibbana kind of fits in that category. There's no subject. There's no object. There's no perception or non-perception. There's no being or non-being. There's no time, no space, no dimension, no change. In other words, we can't even say there's nothing. Because no thing is a state of non-being, and that would come under the duality of being and non-being. So we can't even say that, uh, because it includes the uh, supposition of an observer who is seeing that there is no thing. There is a state like that among the jhanas, but that's still a couple of notches below Nibbana. So what is Nibbana? Well, we can't really say. It's beyond language, beyond symbols.
but we can talk about the path of how to reach Nibbana. And so what we're trying to do now is talk about all the things that Nibbana is not and clear away all the wrong understandings or misunderstandings about Nibbana so that it becomes clear when you encounter it in your meditation. So what do the monks say who have actually reached Nibbana? I mean, other than the Buddha? Well, here's a quote from the Theragata. Sti bhuto smi nibhuto. I am grown cool. I am extinguished. That's from the Rahula Terra. So the words sti bhuta and nibhuta indicate cooling. What does that mean, cooling? It means the end of passion, the end of desire, the end of a compulsory consumerism of the senses. <laughs> let me eat this. Let me see that. Let me smell this. Let me taste that. Let me feel this. Let me think about this cool stuff. Well, aren't we kind of doing that in regard to Nibbana? Yes. Yes. The path to Nibbana is also a type of becoming. But at the end of that process of becoming, there is no more becoming. That's the difference. In an ordinary course of becoming, an ordinary process of paticca samuppada, beginning from desire. At the end, we feel unsatisfactory because our desire was not satisfied. So we begin another course of becoming, another cycle of being to try to satisfy this unsatisfactory desire. But that just leads to perpetuation of the same cycle. And round and round we go. And this is samsara. This is the cause of suffering. So we want to get beyond this. We want to get to a state where there is no more becoming. So the Eightfold Noble Path is such a special process of becoming that leads to the end of becoming. Then there's no more becoming. Why? There's no more desire. In order to get to the point where you can experience, again, that's the wrong word because there's no you to experience it. <laughs> but when you experience Nibbana, <laughs> then that's the end of desire because nothing could be better than Nibbana. Uh -huh. My guru, when I was in Vedanta study, my guru used to say, if you have a million dollars, all your one dollar problems are solved. Uh -huh. So, if you have Nibbana, or if you have reached Nibbana, <laughs> it's impossible to avoid these linguistic constructions, even though we know they're not correct. But bear with me, okay? When we realize Nibbana, <laughs> then we have a million dollars, we have a billion dollars, we have a trillion dollars. And after that, all our one dollar problems, like what am I going to eat today, where am I going to sleep today, are solved. We don't need any more to obsess and to be anxious about the little problems of life. Because we see, those are taken care of automatically by the karma that we generated to create this existence in the first place. Because with this body, is born all the requirements and necessities for this body. Astrologers know this. Ask any astrologer. Uh, and there's a common saying that the, uh, uh, the means of providing for a child are born along with the child. And certainly anyone who's had children can attest that that's true. So if a person has good karma, and they're bringing in a soul who, who also has good karma, then the necessities for that bodily existence of that being manifest automatically. You don't have to make a lot of endeavor for them. So this is what you find out when you become a monk. And you give up everything. And you just sit there under a tree. And somehow or other, magically, things come to you when you need them. Money comes, or food comes, or whatever you need, a place to stay, or friends, or whatever. They just come. You don't have to be anxious about it. You don't have to make an effort to satisfy any needs that you have. However, when you make a desire, then you have to work. 
because you have to generate the karma that manifests that desire. And that means you have to create causes for that desire to manifest as an effect. Things get complicated real fast <laughs> because all the actions that you take with your work have unintended consequences. They become causes of things that you never intended, never expected, couldn't foresee. And so life gets more and more complex and we get caught up in the whirlpools of our own actions. And we'll get to that in the next part of this series when we talk about vortex theory. Just wait, it's going to be a lot of fun. So why did the scholar monks find the explanations of the Buddha himself and his direct disciples to be insufficient for their purposes? Why did they need to write all these commentaries and sub-commentaries and so on? Well, my theory is that they wanted to propagate their own reputations and their own names down through history. So they thought, well, we can explain this better than the Buddha. Or maybe they just didn't understand the Buddha's explanations because they weren't practitioners. They were scholars, and they were dealing with words and symbols instead of the actual things that Buddha was talking about. Again, Nibbana is not a thing, but we have to use this poor language to describe it. So they weren't practitioners. They didn't have the experience. They didn't have the direct personal knowledge. They were only dealing in logic and symbols and semantics and symbology and so on. So they got it all wrong. But the people who are actually practicing the Buddha's teaching say that it brings a unique form of appeasement. And what does appeasement mean? Well, the Ratana Sutta says, Ladha mudha nibuting bhunjamana. They experience the bliss of appeasement, one free of charge. Now, appeasement means to bring a state of peace, quiet, ease, calm, or contentment, to pacify, to soothe, to satisfy, allay, or relieve, or assuage. Now, this is a better description of Nibbana than extinction, okay? Extinction carries the connotation of the end of something, the death of something, without resurrection. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that you can enter Nibbana and you can disappear, but that isn't the end. Even though the eye is gone, even though the mind is gone. There is something after Nibbana, or along with Nibbana. It's hard to describe. In fact, it's impossible. <laughs> but this appeasement, what does it mean? It, this is a better explanation even than cooling down. Appeasement means that all of our uh, anxiousness, all of our suffering, is finished. We no more feel a need to strive to make things happen or to do things, but just allow things to unfold in the natural way. And that is a better meaning, a better definition of Nibbana, appeasement, peace. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta